Hello, and welcome to another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Joe Weisenthal. And I'm Tracy Alloway. All right, Tracy, trivia time. <laughs> you probably know the answer. I know the answer because <laughs> we d- talked about this yesterday. Because we know the, the topic. Of, yeah. but, but prior, okay, okay, pr- prior to yesterday, yes. had I asked you, do you know the fastest GDP growing country in the world? Would you have known the answer? I 100% would have said, wait for it. Guiana. <laughs> you would have really? Did you really no. know that? No, of course not. But now that I know it, I can't lie about <laughs> yeah. it. I can't reverse engineer my lack of knowledge. Uh, Guiana, yeah. which is kind of surprising, you know, relatively unknown South American country. Yeah, People don't talk about it that much. No. People do not talk about it uh, that much, but it is the fastest growing economy in the world. I think it was like they had a year of like 47% GDP growth or something like that recently. But where people are talking about Guiana a lot more specifically is in the en- energy industry, in the oil industry specifically. There's a lot of oil there and a lot of oil being discovered all the time. Like I think, you know, we talk about U.S. supply a lot on the show, but outside the U.S., I think like almost all the oil is being discovered in Guyana these days. Yeah, I actually saw a tweet in the course of this research saying that since 2015, one out of every three barrels of new oil discovered has been in Guyana. And of course, there's a lot of interest in it right now not just because it could be a potential source of additional crude at a time when the world seems to really need some extra oil, uh, but also because it's the sort of new player in the market, right? It hasn't necessarily declared an allegiance to any one country or any one group of Mm -hmm. oil producing nations. I'm thinking of OPEC in particular, of course. And so it's sort of like, it kind of feels like it's up for grabs. Yeah. So when we think about oil, we talk all the time about what's going on in U.S. production. Uh, We talk about OPEC, talk about OPEC plus, uh, including Russia. But here is this new entity and it potentially could be very significant. And so it raises all sorts of interesting questions. What's it going to mean to uh, the global oil market? And what are, you know, okay, the incredible GDP growth of Mm. Guyana right now, how sustainable is it? And what is the best prospect for the sort of oil riches to really translate into meaningful economic development for the country? Right. So this is something I find very interesting because when we think of a lot of oil producing nations or we think about countries that are blessed with lots of resources, we automatically start thinking about something known as the resource curse. Yeah. So even if you have a ton of valuable things that the rest of the world really wants, it doesn't automatically translate into really good economic growth. And in fact, over the course of history, a lot of countries that have been blessed with natural resources have experienced subpar development. So the question for a country like Guyana is, can it avoid the resource curse? And also in an environment where we're talking about commodity shortages, oil and gas shortages, things like that, does the resource curse still exist? Mm. Maybe things start to change now. Yeah, that's a great that's a great question. And then of course just how successfully will the country be in developing its own resources because you can have theoretically abundant resources, but it takes skill and it takes some sort of, you know, basic uh, you know, a certain like there are degrees to which uh, how well a country can exploit uh, their own natural resources. Anyway, I'm really excited about our guest. We're going to be speaking to a historian of oil who's going to help us sort of contextualize and understand what's going on in Guyana and in the oil market more broadly. We're going to be speaking to Gregory Brew. He is a postdoctoral fellow at the Jackson School for Global Affairs at Yale University. And and he is the author of two forthcoming books on oil, and we'll get to those. But uh, let's bring him in. Uh, Gregory, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Hi, Joe. Hi, Tracy. Thanks so much for having me on. Yeah, uh, really excited to chat with you. So let's just start. I mean, like outside of a few conversations about energy, you don't hear much people talking about the fastest growing uh, economy in the world, Guyana. But how big of a deal are they and these ongoing new discoveries that keep being made there in terms of the oil market? Yeah, so I think the, the statistic you threw out just a moment ago is accurate. I think the last two years, Guyana has in excess of 40% GDP growth, which is obviously just astounding. That's incredible. Um, It's incredible. Yeah. And the the other statistic, which was noted, was, yeah, since 2015, one out of every three new barrels that have been discovered worldwide have been discovered in Guyana, specifically off the the coast and offshore offshore blocks. So Guyana has been, I would argue, one of the most sort of exciting oil stories 
of the last uh, five or six or seven years. Uh, and it's really where a lot of the attention is on um, when you get outside of the United States and you get off of the shale patch, places like the Permian or uh, the Bakken or Marcellus shale fields, Guyana is really where the action is, especially for, you know, for the companies that are involved there, like Exxon, Hess, Shell, Total. Yeah, full disclosure, I think I got that stat about um, the oil barrels, one in every three oil barrels uh, discovered having been in Guyana. I think I got that from your Twitter account. So, <laughs> so, so, this is a nice well, like, I got circuit. it from Bloomberg, so yeah. I can't, you know, I'm not pulling those stats out of nowhere. Very circular. <laughs> yeah. All right. But actually, so I have a question on this. So I, I believe the oil in Guyana was discovered in 2015, and you already mentioned that most of it is offshore, maybe all of it is offshore. Why did it take so long? Hmm. Like, was there new technology developed that made those oil reserves viable? Or did no one know that they were there? Because, I, you know, I think about its geographic location. It's not that far away from Venezuela. We know Venezuela has oil. So why would we not have assumed that maybe hmm. Guyana does too? Yeah, absolutely. I think it stemmed from three sort of core causes. Uh, the first was the government in Guyana got interested in opening up areas for oil exploration around 2002, 2003. So there was a local sort of policy change uh, that uh, opened areas up for exploration. I think there was a technological shift. Like, obviously, uh, deep water and offshore oil drilling has become much more advanced in the last 20, 30 years. Uh, you were able to conduct more sort of intensive seismic geological surveys. So finding oil is a little bit easier. Um, but it was also just a function of majors like Exxon were interested in searching areas that other companies, other places hadn't really looked at. And Guyana was you know, something of a, of a new area. But it did take a while. I think Exxon, which is sort of the major player here uh, when you're looking at the companies that are involved down there, Exxon started looking offshore Guyana in about 2008. Uh, hmm. And I think, uh, you know, drilling started in earnest in 2015. So it took a while and then, you know, really started coming on in 2017, 2019. So it took a while. You know, as we all know, there are pretty long lead times on greenfield oil uh, exploration production operations. And Guyana was no different. Can I ask just one more sort of process question? But when we say that Exxon is the major player there and they decided to start exploring, how does it actually work? Mm. Does, you know, an, an oil company comes to a government and they say, hey, we think there might be some oil under the ground or offshore or wherever. We're interested in exploring it. And then they start doing that. And then they get like a first mover advantage before other people start coming in. Or do they get exclusive rights? How does it work? Yeah, that's a great question. So, you know, historically, companies like Exxon, you know, the big international companies, they have the resources to do this kind of exploration because they can go to a, a country like Guyana and say, you know, if you give us a concession, if you give us rights to an offshore or an onshore block, uh, then we'll, you know, we'll pay a royalty, we'll give you a share of the profits once we've recouped our investment, right? So we'll put up the money, we'll search. If we find something, you'll get a piece of it. But if not, then we're really the ones who are on the hook here. The government doesn't really have to put up much up front. So the company is taking on the risk. Uh, as far as the offshore fields are concerned, Exxon's down there working uh, in a consortium of companies along with Hess, Hess uh, Total, Shell. And that's, you know, that's just a way of spreading the risk around, right? A big, even a big company like Exxon doesn't want to take on all the risk for a big offshore operation like in Guyana. So I think the stats, I mean, I think it's something like a 35% share is what Exxon has down there. I might be a little bit off on that. But as far as how it's splitting things up with the government, Exxon pays a 2% royalty and 50% of profits after recouping the investment. And now that they have, you know, now that they have done, they've earned back the money that they spent exploring and drilling, both Exxon and the government of Guyana are starting to make uh, significant profit hmm. from the offshore operation. So I've seen some stories, and I'm not exactly sure what's going on, but is there some thought within the government there to just set up a state-owned oil company and cut out these international majors? Because it's still like their oil, they set the laws. Like, what is this sort of stance currently in terms of uh, uh, the sort of future of this relationship, I guess I'd put it? Right. So the relationship is still fairly new. You know, we were we, operations have only really been ongoing for a couple of years. Guyana is a fairly small country. It has a population of about 800,000 people, I think. 
a fairly small, underdeveloped economy outside of the oil industry. Uh, and I think as far as setting up a state-owned oil company, I don't think the government is there yet. But I wouldn't be surprised if, uh, you know, if momentum started to build towards that. Because, you know, if you look at history, if you look at how uh, these things have gone in places like Venezuela, Iran, Iraq, Saudi Arabia, generally speaking, foreign companies, very often American companies, they come in, they put up the investment, they do the exploration, they start production. And within a few years, a decade or so, the local government has built up the resources, the technical know-how, the proficiency that it needs to set up a national oil company and to start thinking like, hey, why do we need these foreign companies to do this? We can operate this industry ourselves. Then you start seeing momentum towards nationalization or taking a more significant share in the operation. I don't think that's started yet, but I wouldn't be surprised if the momentum builds towards that in the next few years. So we've been talking about corporate interest in Guyana's oil. What about I guess, interest from a sort of sovereign, Hmm. strategic, political level. If Exxon comes in, starts developing the oil, Exxon is an American company, does that like automatically equate to suddenly Guyana is going to be America's new best best friend and maybe a sort of offset to, um, you know, uh, OPEC countries and Saudi Arabia, which doesn't seem to be playing ball with the Biden administration at the moment? I'm not sure if there's really much focus on that quite yet because it's still fairly early days. Um, I think, you know, I think there there is often an association that a company like Exxon works as an arm of U.S. foreign policy, and that generally really isn't the case. Hmm. Exxon Mobil, other U.S. other major energy companies are in business for themselves, and they see operations like the operation in Guyana as a commercial operation. Uh, I don't know if the U.S. government sees it that way. I don't know if there are discussions inside the Biden administration about getting closer to Guyana, trying to form a closer relationship with an eye towards developing, you know, as you say, sort of relationships with non-OPEC oil producers. But again, I wouldn't be surprised if we started seeing conversations like that, if the U.S. relationship with OPEC continues to get frostier, continues to get more antagonistic, I think there will be more interest in that. Again, you know, as a historian, I'm always seeing parallels in history. And this is something that occurred in the 1980s when the U.S. was very interested in moving away from reliance on OPEC. It formed closer relationships with places like Canada, Mexico, Norway, the United Kingdom. These sources of non-OPEC oil became much more important. So it's entirely possible that we could see something like that happen between the U.S. and Guyana in the years ahead. So let's stick with the history theme, your specialty. Is there another country throughout history that sort of has a parallel where for a long time, maybe people weren't thinking of it as a power player and then it emerged very fast? And so when you see the rise of Guyana, does it make you think of anything else? Sure. I mean, you know, in preparing to come on today, I did uh, I did some background reading. I refreshed myself a little bit on the history of things like the resource curse, yeah. you know, the Dutch disease, uh, the paradox of plenty, all of that. And you really do see stark parallels between what is happening in Guyana and what happened in Venezuela, Saudi Arabia in the 1950s and 60s. These were relatively, you know, you go back 60, 70 years, go back to say 1945, right? The end of World War II. Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, fairly small countries economically, fairly small populations. But as far as their footprint geopolitically or, or you know, sort of geoeconomically, they became very important very quickly to the global economy because of their status as major oil exporters. So as far as where Guyana is headed, you know, as the operations continue to expand, you know, right now it's producing about 300,000 barrels a, a day. Within a year, it could be producing a million. Wow. Within three or four years, it could be producing two million. I mean, wow. they've had to keep expanding the estimates of proven reserves as they find more and more oil. So, you know, things could just keep going up from here. So I think there are definitely parallels between where Guyana is and where these sort of more mature or more sort of older petro states like Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, where they were 60 or 70 years ago. Wow. In many ways, history does seem to be repeating itself. 
So one thing that has happened historically as well is we do get these periods of excitement about a new commodity producing nation. And the one that I can remember most recently was Mozambique and natural gas. And everyone got really excited. Oh, they have all these gas reserves and they're going to be a new powerhouse on the global commodities markets. And, you know, fast forward many, many years, I was reading today that Mozambique is going to send its first LNG shipment to Europe uh, relatively soon, I think this month. And that's after years and years and years of people talking about Mozambique being the next big gas exporter. What are the sort of challenges or potential problems that can come on stream as resource production gets ramped up? Like, why do we have these periods of excitement only sometimes to be disappointed? Right, absolutely. So you're absolutely right. You know, very often when these big finds are made, when these big discoveries are made, there's an intense early period of very high expectations, right? Where could this lead? You know, how could this develop into an even larger find? How do we transform reserves into exports, right? Because you need to manage the resource in order to develop it in order to in order for it to grow, turn into something that could be exported. And I think in the case of Guyana and other sort of early stage uh, resource rich states, the question really comes down to local government, local resource management, and the relationship between the local government and foreign companies. So in some cases, I'm not too familiar with the Mozambique case, but in some cases, there's a fairly early pushback from the local government to foreign companies. You see expropriations, you see nationalizations, you see a local attempt to seize control of the resource at a very early stage. And that can sometimes lead to uh, resource mismanagement. It can lead to capital being drained away or in some cases being sort of scared off. And very quickly, the expectations, the excitement drains away and you're left with uh, uh, an industry, a resource that can't get off of its feet. And I think right now, uh, in the course of doing research for this, uh, you know, for this appearance, I was reading a little bit about the Guyana government's attitude towards mm. Exxon, and they're interested in maintaining a close relationship with Exxon. They have a lot of grievances with Exxon's approach to things like royalty and tax payments, but they're very interested in maintaining this relationship because they want the resource to grow, because they want exports to come on. They're worried about following the footsteps of a Mozambique. Uh, or even in a, a, of a Venezuela, where oil industry, the oil industry has you know, almost entirely collapsed in the last uh, mm. six or seven years as the result of various state management policies and that sort of thing. So you know, there is this early period of excitement, but where it goes from here depends in large part on how the local government decides to act on the kinds of policies it tries to implement and on how it manages its relationship with uh, the big foreign companies. So I have two questions. The first one is kind of short, but when we talk about, okay, maybe in, at some point Guyana could set up a state-owned oil company, does the, does the existence of a state-owned oil company preclude the possibility of Exxon having a significant role? Or could you still have a state-owned oil company in name, but still uh, outsource a lot of operational decisions to a multinational with significant expertise? Yeah, absolutely. So generally how this has gone is, you know, after the initial discovery, after the early stage investment, where you mostly have foreign companies operating the industry, a national energy company is established and then it proceeds to mature over the course of, you know, several years, a decade, several decades. It develops technical expertise. It develops a professional workforce. And at some point, it obtains a share or participation in the general industry. So it operates in partnership with companies like Exxon. In some cases, mm -hmm. there's a total expropriation. There's a total nationalization. Exxon is kicked out. The operations are taken over by the state oil company. But in other cases, you do see it sort of a transitional stage where there's more partnership, there's more participation between the state-owned energy company and the foreign international. Mm -hmm. So that does happen. And I would imagine, you know, where the Guyana government currently is and where it wants to go, I think, in managing this resource, I wouldn't be surprised if that's the course they decide to take. Establish a state-owned firm, you know, gradually enter the operations, take on an increasing share, and gradually nationalize the industry, keeping a role for uh, you know, foreign companies like Exxon to continue to grow the reserve, to continue to explore, and to take advantage of 
the foreign technical expertise and the foreign capital, right? So even if even as they develop, you know, greater resources and greater earnings, they're still going to be looking for foreign capital to further develop the industry. So what does history say about the countries that have done this best, not just in terms of building out their domestic production, but distributing it widely so that, you know, that you don't have the sort of resource curse, Dutch disease phenomenon? What are the best examples of paths that countries have taken so that the benefits really do accrue across the country and you have like widespread economic development? Absolutely. This is the big question, right? There are a few good examples. Um, the classic example that people point to is Norway. Norway discovered offshore oil and gas in the late 1960s. By the 1990s, 1980s, it was a major exporter. It's still a major exporter today. And yet it, it doesn't seem to have suffered from governance issues. It doesn't seem to have suffered from you know, widespread state corruption. And it's been able to develop its resource uh, efficiently. It's been able to distribute revenues in a, an acceptable and sort of equitable way. Uh, other examples would be the United Kingdom, which discovered oil in the late 1960s in the North Sea, became a major exporter in the 1980s. Um, but there really aren't many. You know, mm. in many cases where oil is discovered, uh, it doesn't generate the kinds of uh, viable positive economic results you want to see. And there are many reasons for that. And one of the reasons for it is that very often, and this is this is some of the one of the more troubling aspects, very often the resource is controlled and dominated at an early stage by foreign capital. Mm. So foreign companies, you know, like they're interested in developing oil, they're not very interested in general national economic development, right? What they want to do is develop resources that they can produce profit from to return to their shareholders. So in states like Guyana, or looking back into history, states like Iran, Venezuela, Saudi Arabia, in early stages of the development of oil industries where you had an oversized role being played by foreign capital, you had these problems around governance, you had these problems around corruption and a lack of adequate economic development appearing at an early stage. And you know, once they had matured, once they had become sort of set in stone, it was very difficult for national governments to correct them. Uh, so the problem of you know what role foreign capital can play in this you know in the the so-called resource curse is something that I have a great interest in uh, as an academic, as a scholar. Um, but I think it's also something that governments like Guyana are conscious of. You know, how, we how do we manage this resource adequately uh, on a national level while still retaining the support of foreign capital that we need to develop our industry? Right knowing that foreign capital mm. may not share our same political, economic, and social interests in the development of that resource. That's a huge question that yeah. has faced states throughout the 20th century and faces Guyana today. So I realized in the intro, I said, well, maybe things are different and the resource curse doesn't exist anymore because everyone needs oil. But actually, actually, you could very easily argue it the other way around and say, since people need more oil, prices are higher, you're going to get even more interest in this scarce commodity. And I have heard a really basic analogy for the resource curse. I I've heard people compare it to a lottery. So the same thing that happens to someone who wins mm. a big Powerball prize, you know, rarely does that actually lead to a good outcome for them in terms of standards of living. I would be different for what it's worth. Me too. Me too. I'm sure we would all be very, everyone listening to <laughs> this podcast would be different. And if I found a lot of oil in my backyard, I would, also, I would also not let it, let it same mess thing. me up. Okay, great. Uh, we've established that. But does an era of resource scarcity, does that maybe make the danger of a resource curse more acute? That's a good question. I think it can. And I think part of the reason that it can is that the problems associated with the resource curse often become worse if the price of said resource is perceived to be high and is expected to rise in future years, right? So the temptation to develop a dependence on this resource it's very easy to uh, to accept if you think like, well, this is selling, you know, this is selling for eighty dollars a barrel now, but as it becomes more scarce moving forward, it's going to sell for one hundred and one hundred twenty dollars a barrel in the future. We would be fools not to not to grow this industry, right? We would be fools not to invest in it. So I think the expectation of scarcity or the expectation, let's say, of high prices, can encourage the development of the resource curse. But that leads to you know even bigger problems which is this, the problem of volatility, right? If your national economy is based around an export that right. you hope will retain its value, then you're surrendering your economic agency to the vagaries of a market, right? 
a producer, even a prolific producer like Guyana, can't be expected to, you know, exert influence over the global price of oil, at least, you know, outside of a very marginal impact. They're essentially surrendering their economic fortunes to the global oil market. So that is, you know, that's that's sort of inherent to the dilemma of the resource curse, the dilemma of resource exporting nations like Guyana. And I imagine it's going to raise some difficult questions for Guyanan lawmakers, policymakers, uh, as they sort of continue to grow their their national industry. So since you mentioned the boom bust of oil, I think that's a good opportunity to sort of broaden things out a little bit. But before we do, what is the prospect of a future relationship between Guyana and OPEC? It's Mm -hmm. not currently a member of OPEC. Could it be at some point in the future? What would have to happen for it to become one? And were it to become a member of OPEC, like how big of a player within, like put it in context of where it would stand versus some other uh, exporters, other big players? Right. So an important thing to know about OPEC is its membership has always been changing. Hmm. It was founded in 1960 by core members, uh, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Iraq, Kuwait, and Venezuela. It was later joined by countries like Libya, Algeria, uh, later countries like uh, Indonesia, Ecuador. Um, you know, so it's broadened its membership over the course of the last several decades. In some cases, members have left. You know, Qatar is no longer a member of OPEC. So the, the membership of OPEC has been changing. For Guyana to join OPEC, it would need to develop what we discussed earlier, which is a national oil company. Uh, it would have to develop sort right. of a national oil ministry. It would need to, to have a slightly more advanced infrastructure around governing its resource. Because an important, you know, an important part of how OPEC works is the management of oil, not only on a national level, but on an international level. Um, so I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't close the door on uh, uh, Guyana joining OPEC at some point in the future. I think we're some ways away from that happening. I think uh, were it to join, now this is of course contingent on how Guyana oil production develops, but were it to join, Guyana would be a fairly important member of OPEC. Were it to reach a point where it's producing and exporting upwards of a million, even a million and a half barrels a day, that would place it, uh, you know, that would place it along the lines of countries like Iraq uh, and Iran that are exporting that much. And again, as Guyana's reserves grow, which is an even more important question, right now its reserves are estimated around 11 billion barrels, but that number has grown quite significantly over the last several years. So as its reserves grow, then its role within the international oil economy and its potential role in OPEC uh, could become even more significant. Can you remind me, why can't the U.S. join OPEC? Is it um, like price fixing law, something like that? I'm just thinking <laughs> the U.S. has an interest in smoothing oil booms and busts. So, you know, may- maybe they can join OPEC, too. No, I know they can't. But why is that? <laughs> well, this is funny. The, the, the meeting that Joe referenced that we were at last week, um, I gave a little talk about oil policy and the oil dilemma facing the United States. And someone in the room asked, uh, you know, how does the U.S. solve its problem? And I said, well, the U.S. could join OPEC. That would, that would solve some problems. No, I, I think there are obviously a number of reasons. Antitrust law is one of them. Mm. Um, the other one is, uh, you know, sort of a basic question of oil policy. The U.S. has no national oil company. It has really no national oil policy. It has hundreds of private companies that manage oil resources according to, you know, commercial incentives, market incentives. Um, in the past, the U.S. has had production management policies Hmm. uh, that in many ways mirror what OPEC does. Wasn't OPEC Uh, like inspired by the Texas Railroad Commission? Like didn't Texas sort of invent OPEC? Yeah, no, yeah. Abdullah Tariqi, one of the founders of OPEC, imagined a pro-rationing scheme by which OPEC could manage global oil production. And he modeled his scheme on the TRC, on the Texas Railroad Commission. I uh, took a class in college on yeah. the history of Texas oil. So, and that's the one fact that I remembered. I don't remember anything else <laughs> about the class, but I do remember that the Railroad Commission was like this sort of, uh, you know, uh, inspiration for OPEC. So I'm glad I got a chance to use that professionally. Yeah, it, it's the, the, the famous the famous Texas institution with the funny name yeah. that, does, that does something completely different from what it sounds like. Yeah, the Texas Railroad Commission used to manage Texas oil. Um, but yeah, I mean, the U.S., the United States had mandatory import quotas. It had pro-ration production in Texas and Louisiana and Oklahoma. You know, it used to have a lot of oil management, uh, oil production management policies that it no longer really has. So I think, you know, the question of whether or not the U.S. could join OPEC uh, 
is uh, sort of neither here nor there. But could the U.S. and OPEC work together on managing the global supply, the global price of oil? That I imagine could be a possibility. It would take you know quite a lot to happen. It would take uh, quite a change in the relationship between the United States and OPEC. But uh, I could certainly see it developing in the future as the U.S. grows into a more important uh, oil exporter, oil producer. Right. So it's not really about whether or not they could join OPEC, but the fact that we're even talking about it kind of highlights this ongoing problem for America. And maybe that maybe that's our cue to get back into yeah. the boom bust stuff. So we have spent the better part of this year talking about ways to bring down oil prices, different ways, whether it's oil companies just ramping up production or whether or not it's something um, more, I guess, uh, complex, like the uh, the derivative solution, the hedging solution that um, Scanda proposed and successfully, um, yeah. you know, got accepted by the Biden administration. But maybe we just jump to the big question. Is there something about oil that makes it inherently cyclical? Is this always going to be a cyclical industry? Are there limits to the extent to which we can actually smooth those cycles? Yeah, I think there's sort of an inherent volatility to the oil industry, and it's based on just how oil is produced, right? And when I say produced, what I really mean is mined. Oil is in some ways a mineral that's mined from the earth. The problem with producing oil, mining oil, is that you can't store it very effectively. And once you start producing it, it's hard to stop, right? So you can move through periods of scarcity and into periods of abundance or oversupply very easily because managing production can be very difficult. Uh, you have a constant chase for revenue, for profit, because you need to recoup your investment. Oil is famously very expensive industry to get into. It's very expensive. It's very costly to develop a field. But once you do develop that field, you can produce large amounts of oil very quickly, potentially flooding the market. Hmm. So historically, you know, looking back to the early days of the industry, the 1870s, the 1880s, where uh, in many cases, producers would take the oil that they produced from their drills and they would flood fields with it because they had no market for it. They had nowhere to store it. Uh, wow. You see a recurrence of this boom bust cycle throughout the history of oil. But what you also see are efforts by entities like the TRC, by OPEC, and by you know the current alignment OPEC plus, you see efforts to stabilize that boom bust volatility, efforts to stabilize the cycle. I think saying that it's sort of naturally cyclical is a little hard for me to accept because of these constant efforts to you know moderate that uh, that that cycle, moderate that volatility. In many ways, the oil industry can't really function without some effort to hmm. mitigate the inherent volatility. And this was something that I mentioned to Joe last week. One of the major problems that everyone has had to grapple with has been the return of the United States hmm. as a major oil exporter. Because of what I mentioned before, the US has no central oil ministry. It can't go to OPEC and talk about pro-rationing production control. President Biden can give a speech where he talks to oil and gas companies, but at the end of the day, he has very little control over domestic oil production. So this is a big problem, yeah. right? How do you manage a, globe, a volatile global oil market when your biggest producer has no control? Right. I, I wanted to talk more about this point exactly, because I think when the U.S. oil industry really started booming like crazy in the last decade, there was probably some optimism. They're like, oh, we're going to like wean ourselves off of uh or we're, we're, gonna, we're no longer going to be dependent on right, oil OPEC independence. Anymore. Trump oil was talking about it all yeah, the time. Oil independence, right. And, the, and that oil independence seemed like it was going to be great. And for a while, obviously, the price of oil plunged, but now it's really expensive again. And so, you know, even with all of the U.S. capacity either currently producing or uh, available to produce, it hasn't um, curbed the, it doesn't seem like it's done anything to curb, curb the boom bust cycles. And sort of to listen to you, it sounds like it's very unnatural and ahistorical to have a significant amount of oil out on the global market that is not subject to some sort of curbs, setting aside like the selling of the SPR. Like that is just very unusual to have this. I guess now Guyana would be part of this, but now there is a lot more and more oil that just isn't part of any production management plan. Absolutely. You know, there's the U.S. oil that's being pumped to the market. 
There's also a tremendous amount of sanctioned oil that's being moved through the global market at discounted prices. It's being moved through illicit market channels. You have actors like Russia, Venezuela, Iran that are trying to evade Western sanctions by selling oil uh, through sort of illicit means. So that's creating you know greater uncertainty, and that's making control even harder. Right? It's making mitigating volatility even harder. So yeah. Looking back through history, you constantly see efforts by various state, international, or even local actors to try to control this flow. Uh, you saw efforts by major Western oil companies in the 50s and 60s to moderate production to try to make sure that supply could match demand. And we don't have a similar structure, a similar yeah. system for managing that. And the additional problem is that in the past, you know, the past 30 years, it was possible to manage supply with demand because you knew that demand was going to increase in the years ahead. Mm. And that is no longer right. a certainty. If anything, we're certain that demand is going to decline. So that's making it a lot harder for private companies, but also for OPEC members to know how much they need to invest, to know how much they need to produce, because there's great uncertainties about the availabilities of markets moving forward. If anything, Shortage of market is going to be a bigger problem than shortage of supply. Imagine going back 10 years ago and saying, we're going to have an EV revolution and the U.S. is going to be this huge producer and oil is going to get more expensive because of both those things. That would have like broken so many minds, but that's exactly what happened. Gregory Brew is such a treat to have you on. I learned so much in that 40 minutes. Uh, really appreciate you uh, coming on Odd Lots. Thank you so much. It was great. Crazy. I really, I feel like I learned a lot in that last episode. Oil right? history is fun. Yeah. And he, Gregory is uh, really good at talking about it and contextualizing it. But I do want to start with that, that last point because uh, it is pretty wild to think we had this huge U.S. oil boom in the last decade. It became the biggest oil producer in the world. We had the EV revolution, which everyone expects is going to curb demand. And yet here we are with like the cost of gasoline surging. Everyone was wrong. Everyone was wrong in all of like the most unexpected ways. It's so weird. Um, the other thing I thought that really stood out to me was his point about how we know that the U.S. has come online as yeah. a big oil producer, but actually they don't have a lot of ways That's to right. control production, yeah. which causes problems for the rest of the world. I mean, especially in 2013 when we had the shale revolution and then prices collapsed, yeah. we saw a lot of that. But now it's the opposite problem, right? Like, how do we get everyone to actually start pumping oil? Right. And, you know, there's a lot of people like, oh, we need to pump more oil in the U.S. And it's like, why isn't the White House doing more to boost domestic oil? And I don't think it's impossible to think that the White House has levers it can pull that it hasn't. But there's no national. It, it is not right. like They're the OPEC countries companies. where we say, OK, yeah. we're going to expand our daily quota to 100 a thousand. 100,000 more barrels like that. There's just no equivalent of that. here, Right. And telling private companies what to do is not no. historically a very like successful American political strategy, I think. Um, that was fascinating. And now I'm going to be following Guyana's yeah. economic trajectory for years. Now. Well, I think the cool thing about that and what is really helpful is we know that there are so many countries, as Gregory talked about, that have gone through a similar mm. trajectory, a similar path, find a lot of oil, figure out how to manage the relationship between the domestic interest and the foreign multinationals interest. So it'll be very interesting to see if with the knowledge of so much history of other countries that have gone this route, whether uh, Guyana can maintain, you know, this like extremely rapid economic growth and whether it could be high quality, well distributed growth. You know, the other thing I was thinking about, one of the persistent commodity mysteries to me has always been Morocco and its fertilizer reserves. I think it has like the world's biggest supply of phosphates or something. Yeah. And yet it never actually seems to translate into a significant economic boom. Let's do a uh, Moroccan Moroccan fer yeah, fertilizer episode. Okay. All right. Anyone know any Moroccan uh, phosphate? People? DM us. Yeah. Please let us know. Shall we leave it there? Let's leave it there. Okay. This has been another episode of the Odd Lots podcast. I'm Tracy Alloway. You can follow me on Twitter at Tracy Alloway. And I'm Joe Weisenthal. You can follow me on Twitter at The Stalwart. Follow our guest, Gregory Brew. He's at GBrew24. Follow our producer, Carmen Rodriguez, at Carmen Armin. And check out all of our podcasts under the handle at podcasts. And 
For more Odd Lots content, go to Bloomberg.com slash Odd Lots. Tracy and I blog there. We post the transcripts. And there's a once a week newsletter for listeners where we talk about all the things and related topics that we discussed on the show. Thanks for listening. 